Yes. So oh, yeah, you my name is Dion Almeida. I'm the developer program here at Vera Google and I uh, run a little site called ajaxian.com which is all about Ajax. And that's where I first kind of met Steve. I uh, had him come out for this conference called the Ajax Experience to talk about all of this great stuff he was doing at Yahoo with respect to performance uh, that then went on become, to become his book and uh, the YSLOW uh, application Firebug extension that he's going to talk about. And uh, he's got some fun anecdotes about uh, how he came up with the name and some other fun stories to share with us. So let's uh, all welcome Steve from Yahoo. I just want to say every once in a while in your career you get to meet uh, people who are incredibly smart and incredibly nice people too, and Dion's one of those guys. And uh, so I wanted to present you with a copy of my book, Dion. Oh, very nice. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having me here. I'm sorry? <laughs> I'm sentimental. I'm emotional. That's okay. Um, so. Uh, uh, my name is Steve Souders. I'm the Chief Performance Yahoo. Um, and um, I understand Doug Crockford from Yahoo was here a month or so ago. So uh, it's uh, maybe not the first time that someone from Yahoo has come and done a presentation at Google. Um, but I do have to say uh, I w you know, was wondering how this was going to go and, and you know, was trying to get myself uh, uh, prepared for this. And, and so I just wanted to start off with this note. And I don't know if anyone remembers concentration. Ed McMahon was one of the hosts for it, yeah? And um, so uh, anyone from the audience want to take a guess? Sissy Spacek and someone who looks like Peter Frampton in the movie Carrie. How many people here actually know what this expression means or has ever used it? So preaching to the choir might have been another good one to use, but in Rebus, that, I didn't think that was as interesting. Um, so so I, my wife said, no one's going to know what that means. So I thought I would look it up in Wikipedia and bring that as well. So, so it, it kind of means something that's, um, uh, so it's selling coal uh, or, or carrying coal to Newcastle. It's something that is maybe uh, foolhardy or pointless. Um, and so given how fast Google Sites are and the work that you're doing on performance, uh, maybe there's not a lot of uh, motivation or point for uh, uh, me to come and talk more about performance. But um, as was shown with, with uh, this expression, there, there can even be cases where um, someone comes and, and surprises uh, people by uh, carrying coal to Newcastle and actually being able to sell it. So I'm hoping that uh, there are some takeaways that you can get from these performance best practices that uh, we found at Yahoo, um, and so let's, let's dig into that. So I've been at Yahoo for uh, about eight years, uh, working on various things, and about three years ago, uh, some of the uh, folks there asked me to start a group to focus on performance. And, and so I called the group the Excep Exceptional Performance Group. And the charter is very simple. We're supposed to quantify and improve the performance of all Yahoo products worldwide. So that's a really big charter. We scoped it down a little bit. I kind of break performance into two areas. Response time, so that's kind of a black box perspective of it, and efficiency. Um, so uh, uh, efficiency actually is easier to correlate to, to dollars. Uh, if you can do what you're doing with half the hardware, that's a lot of hardware costs that you've saved, power consumption, rack space. Um, but actually the area that I've focused on for the last three years is the response time. And the main reason for that is at Yahoo, uh, of course, we want to reduce our hardware costs and our power costs, but really it's really important for us to have a very uh, good user experience, very engaging uh, products that increase stickiness and, and user adoption. So that's where we've been focusing. And we've also narrowed it down a little bit by focusing uh, almost exclusively on uh, web apps, so we're not like trying to optimize Yahoo Messenger, um, and we're kind of like a consulting group within Yahoo. We've we've done this at Yahoo in other areas like uh, uh, security and um, uh, f you know redundancy. We can have a small group of people. In my case, our group's about five to seven people. Um, 
we have a small group of people that focus full time on this area and can really do a deep dive. And then we disseminate, we evangelize those uh, best practices across the company. So we build tools like YSlow I'll be showing later. We have lots of other tools. Some we've released, some are internal. Uh, we look at a lot of data. Um, we uh, do research, uh, so we'll, we'll do, we'll, we'll kind of have on the job experience. We'll go out and we'll do consulting with groups and we'll go, oh wow, this is what really made this site uh, go a lot faster. Let's store that away as a best practice. Let's see if we can generalize it and make it applicable, see if it's applicable to 80% of the uh, properties. That's what we call them at Yahoo. 80% of the properties um, at Yahoo. So we uh, try to identify these best practices. Sometimes we have to research the best practices. So no one's actually doing it yet, but we think there's a way to navigate through this the set of constraints to find something that's going to uh, accelerate the user experience. So we do research, and when we um, find these best practices, we evangelize them out to the to the company. So when I started this, um, my background is more on uh, back-end engineering. Um, so some of the first projects I did at Yahoo, I ran the My Yahoo team for three years. I built an architecture that pushed all of our content, all our our sports scores and movie listings and TV listings worldwide. Uh, I wrote a caching layer um, between all of our properties. So if you, you had a property that needed personal information, like someone's calendar for that day, they wouldn't have to constantly bombard the calendar service with uh, web service calls. We could cache that in a way of, of updating the cache and expiring the cache and flushing the cache. Um, so when I was approached to start this performance team, I thought, okay, well, uh, this is going to work well. You know, I've worked on uh, large-scale systems, trying to make them as efficient as possible. Um, but I said, before I start digging into this, if the, it, we identified early on that the goal was really to make the user experience faster. I said, let me look at that, let me analyze that, profile that, and see what the long tent in the poll is. And so I found something that um, was kind of surprising, and I'm glad I found it right away because it completely flipped uh, the approach to looking at performance at Yahoo. So this is, uh, this is from a, a packet sniffer called IBM Page Detailer. Each of the bars is an HTTP request. Um, the first, you can see they're labeled. Uh, and the first one is the HTML document. And in this case, this is www.yahoo.com with an empty cache. And the thing that was very surprising to me was um, only 5% of the overall user wait time was getting that HTML document. And that includes not just the web server stitching the content together, but the time for the request to go up and all of the packets to come back. All of that was only 5%. And in my previous life, working on these uh, large websites, that's the part I was always focusing on. How can I build a better database or cache uh, data in, me in memory or uh, change my compiler options, anything to squeeze out a couple more milliseconds. And um, it turns out that I was working on the short tent in the poll. Um, so really the long tent is this, I call it the front end. I think most of the time when someone says the front end part, they might be thinking about like JavaScript execution. So this is bigger than that. It's really, I call front end, everything after the HTML document has arrived to the browser. Once the browser has that delivery of the, of the page, what does the browser have to do from that point forward? I call that the front end part. So there's certainly JavaScript uh, HTML, JavaScript CSS parsing, JavaScript execution, but there also is a lot of other network time involved there for all of these other HTTP requests. Most of the time there isn't for this other part, this front end part, there usually isn't a lot of uh, back end time, web server time, because most of these are static assets that are just read off the disk. But some of them could be AJAX requests or something that take a little longer. But in this case, we found that 95% of the time for a uh, empty cache is spent on everything after the HTML document. So I thought, okay, well, what is it with a primed cache? So even in that case, it's only 12%. There's a little white gap here in the middle where uh, the browser is reading those cached assets off the disk and having to reparse the CSS and JavaScript and execute the JavaScript. And at the end, there are still a handful of requests for images that have changed or ads or beacons or something. But still, only 12% was, was that back-end part, getting the HTML document. 
So I, this you know, really surprised me. And I said, well, maybe this is something peculiar to dub, dub, dub. But as I looked at more and more sites, I found that this uh, pattern held true, that only 10 to 20% of the uh, total end user experience was spent getting the HTML document down. So these are the top, as of about six months ago, these are the top 10 sites in the US. And there's only one that uh, breaks that kind of guideline, and that's Google in a prime cache. So there's only two HTTP requests um, for Google with a prime cache, uh, just www.google.com. Um, and, but even here, the HTML, you'd think like, uh, I think the other one is a beacon. Maybe I was in like a test bucket or something like that. I don't know if it happens all the time. But here, the HTML document was still only 36%. But this is the exception. Almost every site you go to, you'll find what we call the performance golden rule, that 80 to 90% of the end user response time, the time the user is waiting, is spent on this part after the HTML document arrives. And so that's, if you really want to improve response times, that's where you have to focus. I've got three good reasons why uh, you should believe that. One, just the a priori probability of making an improvement is greater if you focus on that front end part. In your wildest dreams, maybe you could cut the back end performance in half. Well, you'd put a five to 10% dent in the response time in the user experience. But if you could cut that front end part in half, you're gonna make a 40 to 45% dent. And that's gonna be huge. Users are actually gonna notice that. So just a priori, you have a better chance of making a big difference. The changes are simpler. So, uh, you know, if you want to change, cut half off the back end response time, you're going to have to come up with a new database schema, uh, optimize your code, uh, replicate your architecture across multiple data centers worldwide. Huge, huge, complex tasks. Whereas you'll see in a minute, I'll talk about some of these guidelines in more detail. Uh, most of them are hours or days of work change your web server configuration, rearrange the page a little bit, nothing that's really that complex. So the changes are simpler and they're proven to work. So uh, my group has worked with uh, probably 100 uh, properties at Yahoo. It's pretty easy for us. In fact, there's only one exception I can think of where we uh, haven't been able to go in and with just a few days work, cut 25% off the response time of any website. And what's also cool is now that the book is out and why slow is out. I'm getting emails from people at small and large companies everywhere that they've tried rules, you know, two, three, and seven, and they've cut 20% or 40% off their response times. So this doesn't just happen at Yahoo and it doesn't just happen at gigantic websites. These rules really apply to almost any web page that you're building. So I wanted to talk a little bit. I'm going to uh, have just a few slides about some research. Uh, and then I'm going to go through the bulk of the talk is the rules that the guidelines we have. And then at the end, I'll run YSLOW and we could like look at some Google sites or any other sites and um, analyze them, do kind of, kind of some live analysis. So uh, uh, my coworker, Tenny Toyer, blogs about most of our research on yuiblog.com. And I'm going to talk about one of these uh, experiments that we wrote up, the browser cache experiment. Um, because a lot of our, our best practices hinge on increasing the use of the browser's cache. But before we really could know how valuable that was, we had to answer the question, how many users come in with a prime cache? We didn't know. No one knew, and I couldn't find any research about that out there in the world. So we uh, made up this experiment where we put a little one-by-one -one pixel in a page, but we had to be kind of careful about these two response headers. We put the expires in the past, and we made sure that on all the servers, the file stamp was identical. So the last modified timestamp for no matter which server you went to for this image would always be the same. And so um, we know that there's going to be two possible uh, HTTP status codes returned for this. Either a 200, which tells us the user had an empty cache, or 304, which tells us that the user had downloaded this image previously, they have it in their cache with this last modified header. So when they requested, when they went to the page again and requested that image again, they made a IMS, uh, if modified since request or conditional get request. They said, I have a copy of this image on my disk that was last modified at this time. And the web server says, oh, we'll just use that one, 304, not modified, just use that one. But 
those two different status codes, 200 and 304, are written into the web server logs. So we can just go through the web server logs and find the ratios of these 200s to 304s and answer these two questions. What percentage of users come in every day with an empty cache? And what percentage of page views happen every day with users with an empty cache? And we'll see that those are two different numbers. So on the first day, no one has seen this image before. So 100% of the users come in at least once a day without having this image. They come in at least once a day considered having an empty cache. And 100% of the page views have an empty cache. But then over time, more and more users are going to get this pixel, this image, written into their cache. And as they go to the pages, that image is going to get a 304 status code response. So after, and we've run this on various sites at Yahoo, it always happens after about 15 days, we hit a steady state. And it always comes out to these numbers. Pretty much no matter what website we're looking at, about 80% of the page views are done with a prime cache or full cache, and 20% with an empty cache. And for users, it varies between 40 to 60. And I don't mean that we run it on property X and it'll be 40, then 60, 40, then 60. What I mean is if property X is really sticky, then maybe only 40% of the users are coming in with an empty cache every day. Whereas if property X uh, is not very sticky, 60%. But it ranges uh, in, in, in those values, in that range. So what does this tell us? Unfortunately, it tells us our job is really hard because both of those numbers are really high. Um, you can't ignore these users who are coming in with an empty cache every day. You know, 50% of your users about are coming in with an empty cache, and that's going to be their first page view. And that's really going to set their expectations, their impression of what the site's performance is going to be like. So you have to optimize for that. You have to make sure that when people come in with an empty cache for that first page view, the page still really fires fast. But then you also have to think about 80% of the time people are coming in with a prime cache. So you don't want to do things that really optimize the empty cache, but then kind of penalize that 80% of page views that happen over time. Um, so uh, that was one experiment we wrote up. And you can go there and you can read the other ones. So now I'm going to dive into the 14 rules. Uh, and I'm actually going to, for the sake of time, because I want to try to wrap up in under an hour, I'm going to skip uh, four of them. And a lot of these, uh, you guys are already, you already know, you're already practicing. But certainly these four, avoid CSS expressions, reduce DNS lookups, uh, remove duplicate scripts, and configure e-tags are things that I haven't seen Google ever be a concern uh, for Google sites. So I'm going to skip those. I'm going to go through the others as fast as I can. Uh, so the most important one, and these are in approximate priority order. So we saw from that uh, packet sniffer plot that there's a lot of HTTP requests that happen after the HTML document comes down. And that's getting even more so. Our sites are becoming um, uh, richer. There's uh, more JavaScript on our pages. So an uh, obvious way to improve performance is to reduce the number of HTTP requests. But the constraint I set myself in, I set for myself was, how do you do that without changing the content on the page? Because I'm not a designer. I don't want to go back and tell the designers that they should maybe not have so many rounded corners or not so many images. Given the content on the page, what the designers have come up with, how can you reduce the number of HTTP requests in that uh, design? So uh, one is, I'm going to go into CSS sprites uh, in the next slide, but let me just do these other three. Um, if you have six JavaScript files, just combine them into one. So you're, instead of six HTTP requests, you're just going to have one. The overhead is going to make that page faster, even if you have Keep Alive on. Uh, same thing if you have four CSS files, combine them into one. Image maps are kind of old school, but if it works for you, if you have four icons that are next to each other and they can just be one image map, do an image map. Inline images are very, very cool. Unfortunately, they're not supported in IE. But if you have, this is where you can actually take like the contents of uh, an image or a JavaScript file or anything else and actually inline it in the page. Um, and so for us, there are some cases where it, this has been so important, we've actually forked our backend code to just deliver data URLs um, for browsers that support it. But the most important one uh, to have a big gain in performance is CSS sprites. How many people here uh, have ever built a sprite? Cool. Uh, the Google front page uses a CSS sprite. Um, so the idea is, how many people here have ever uh, played with a Ouija board? 
wow, more people have built sprites than use a Ouija board. <laughs> I've never had that happen before. That's very cool. Um, so the idea is, you know, with a Ouija board, there's that glass thing that everyone puts their fingers on, the planchette. And so think of, think of any box that you have in your page, a div or a span or whatever, as that planchette. And, and the Ouija board is really all these images that you've combined into a single image. So in this case, these are 60 icons. I don't think the Yahoo front page ever had all 60 of these on the page, but they had a lot of them. And we said, wow, it's a lot of HTTP requests. Let's combine those into a sprite. And when we did that, they said, oh, well, if it's just one image, let's add these other icons that we might want to use in the future. So we have 60 icons here, and we just combined them into one image with a little bit of white space separating them. And now we can take our div, like the planchette, and we can slide it over the uh, background image using the background position uh, CSS styling. And and the size of the div will dictate how much of that background shows through. So now we can get 60 icons available on that page without, with only one HTTP request. So this is really powerful if you have a lot of background images. Um, combining them into one image is, is a way to really cut down on HTTP requests. There are some cases where, depending on if they're being used for corners, you might not be able to fit all of your CSS background images into one sprite. But if you can go from uh, 20 background images to just four images, that's still a huge savings. Um, something that's kind of interesting is you would think that the overall combined size would actually be bigger than the sum of the individual files because of the extra white space. But each individual file has some color table and formatting overhead in it. So when you add them up, the, the combined file, the sprite file, is actually smaller than the sum of all the individual files. So you save download size too. Yeah. Oh, and please ask questions in the middle. Uh, what's the advantage of the white space? Um, just so that uh, your, your box might be a little bigger than the actual image. Like, like my, um, my icon might be a 16 by 16 size, but maybe I have one that's just a candle and it's very narrow. And I might have, if I said, well, let me just try to squeeze them together as close as possible, uh, I might have... Um, gone too far inside that 16 by 16 space. So, you, and then you just add that extra white space just kind of for a little bit of safety, right? It makes it a little more flexible. Okay, so use a CDN. Uh, so I don't know what, I just did some NS lookups on, on these popular sites, with CDNs they used. And uh, yeah, actually you guys host everything on the same domain, so, so, uh, Maybe we could talk le later and you could describe your hardware topology to me. <laughs> uh, but you can see that you know, Akamai is kind of the industry leader. And we, we made this, this change on Yahoo Shopping about two and a half years ago. They were still serving their content off shopping.yahoo.com. We made this one change, moving all the static stuff to our CDN and it cut 25% off the response time. Just this one change alone. And, and the point I, I try to emphasize, especially to kind of startup companies, is make this step before you try replicating your architecture. Because like I was saying before, splitting your back-end application across multiple data centers can be very complex and time-consuming. And this is pretty easy. There are some costs involved paying for a service, Akamai or whatever. There's a new one, Panther, Panther Express, I think, which is very, very reasonable. I just heard about them this weekend. Um, but make this step first before you ever decide to split your back <laughs> architecture. Add a far future expires header. So I want to mention here, I wasn't, uh, uh, I received a very nice compliment on my book that they thought, uh, being that I was from Yahoo, that I was very even-handed in my analysis of different sites, including Google in the book. And I really appreciated that. I, I tried, you know, very sincerely to uh, be objective. So I just want to point out here, I, I didn't pick Frugal because I was trying to find a Google site that was bad. It's just that www.google.com doesn't have really any content on it. It's not very rich. And so it wasn't a very interesting one to analyze. So I looked at, around and I picked Frugal as the kind of Google example to analyze for things like expires headers. Um, and I should also mention, that's why Craigslist isn't on here. Craigslist is still in the top 10, but there's nothing on it. So I f switched it out for AOL. Um, but anyway, what we see here is that uh, depending on the site you're looking at, they, they more or less believe in, in making assets cacheable on the browser. And so the idea here, just really quick, is if you put a far future expires header, 
Now the browser has that on the disk. The next time the user goes to the page, uh, if it hasn't been flushed from the disk cache, the browser says, oh, there's the thing I need. Oh, and look, it's still valid. It's still fresh. It doesn't expire until 2010 or 2038. So it can just use it off the disk. Whereas if you don't have an expires header, the browser will see it on disk if it hasn't been flushed, but it'll say, oh, it's not fresh anymore. Let me make that if modified since conditional get request. And the, the web server can still luckily return a 304 if the asset hasn't changed at all, but that's still a round trip. If you're in Idaho on a slow internet connection, that's gonna slow down the page. So it's really good if you have static assets to put a far future expires header on it. And that way the browser, the next time the user goes to that page can just read it off the disk without any network traffic at all. So the challenge about this is, suppose you have an asset, a JavaScript file or an image and it changes. Well, for years we've had uh, the policy at Yahoo that once you push, push something out to a large user base on the internet, you can't change it because there are so many misconfigured proxies or overly aggressive caching technologies that they might not pick up that change. And when we do make a change, especially if it's like a bug fix to a JavaScript file, we wanna make sure that every user gets that new file. So for years, we've had the policy of putting a timestamp or a version number in our uh, URLs of our static assets. So if you're doing that, if you've already swallowed the pill that you can never change an asset once it's pushed, the only way to do that is to change the file name, you might as well make that asset cacheable forever. So, so sometimes people say like, um, like CNN, uh, only two out of 151 assets have a far future expires header. Well, that's a news site. Maybe a lot of these things were changing a lot. Their photos and they're constantly changing and they, uh, it was just easier for them. So then what I do is I look at the median age. This is the, the number of days between when I ran this test and uh, how far back the, last, the asset was modified based on the last modified header. So I can count the number of days that it's been since this asset was modified. And if I look at the median of those on CNN, it's been seven months. 50% of the assets on this page that are not cacheable have not been touched in seven months. And so we can see that value for other sites. So uh, we kind of had the same attitude, especially with JavaScript and CSS at Yahoo. Oh, well, you know, those are changing a lot. And when we looked at the last modified header, we saw that they really weren't changing as much as we thought. So it's a good practice to look at that and, and uh, figure out if it would make sense to uh, give everything a far future expires header. Um, so it's kind of interesting to look at these rules from the perspective uh, of do they help um, uh, empty cache, so first page uh, viewers, uh, only primed cache or subsequent page viewers or both. So this is one that, and, and the ones that help both are really, really key. So this is one that helps both, um, especially first people who visit the site for the very first time. So you can just compress anything that's not already binary. You don't want to compress images or flash or PDFs, but uh, not just HTML documents, but JavaScript files, uh, CSS files, JSON requests, uh, AJAX requests, all of those can be, can be compressed. And typically you'll cut about 70% off the size of uh, what's sent over the wire. And so everything's gonna get there a lot faster. And there's always some edge case browsers that um, might have problems, but that number is getting smaller and smaller. And you can do different appro approaches like a whitelist uh, approach to turning on gzipping or not. Yeah, and here's the point I was making. It's pretty popular to gzip the HTML document, but it's less well known or less practiced to gzip the CSS and JavaScript. Um, so that would be good to do. Uh, so this is an interesting one. This actually doesn't make the response time, the, the mechanical instrumented response time any faster, but makes the perceived response time faster. And that's really what we're after, trying to make that user experience feel as fast as it can. So the thing that happens here is it's a little different in IE and Firefox. In IE, uh, it gets the HTML page, parses it, finds all the assets that have to be downloaded, all the components or resources. And maybe at the bottom, there's a CSS file, right? Well, IE says, well, that CSS file might 
re change the way that I draw elements in the page, tables or anchors. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to draw anything in the page until I download that CSS file. Well, since it's the last thing in the page, it's one of the last things most likely to get downloaded. So the IE will have all the static HTML text in the page. It might also download images and other things in the page, and it's going to hold all of those. It's just going to leave the page white until it downloads that final CSS file, and then all of a sudden it'll draw the, draw the page. So this isn't what you want. You want to get the CSS files, the style sheet uh, declarations, inclusions, up in the head, and that's also what the spec says to do. So it's a good thing to do. Firefox is different. Firefox will render things when it has them, and so if you had the same scenario where you had a style sheet at the bottom, it would render the HTML, render the images, finally it would download this style sheet which would say draw everything differently, change the font, change the way anchors look, and now you have what's called the flash of unstyled content, the page gets redrawn and it's a flash experience to the user, which isn't pleasant either. So the key is to put the style sheets in the head. Another small change to, to try to follow is don't use the at import uh, rule because in IE that will cause the uh, style sheet to actually be deferred later in the page. And since it's deferred, it, you'll have this uh, non-rendering, no progressive rendering behavior in IE. So use the link tag for pulling in style sheets. And kind of uh, the other side of the coin is scripts. Scripts have two bad behaviors. One is they block all parallel downloads. So uh, with HTTP 1.1, you can download two components per host name in parallel. So if everything was on one host name, you'd see a stair step pattern like this. But maybe you're using two or three host names. So you can actually get some things in parallel, but still, on any given host name, no more than two. I've actually gotten IE to download 114 things in parallel. Um, but as soon as the browser hits a script, and this is in both IE and Firefox, it won't download, start any other downloads, no matter what the host name is, until that script is returned. So uh, one thing you want to be careful of is uh, putting the scripts higher than they need to be. If we could move this script, maybe we couldn't move it all the way down. Maybe it actually is doing a document write or something like that. But if we could move it just a little ways down, some of those images would actually be drawn. Once they got downloaded, the browser would go ahead and render them, and all of the text above the script would be rendered. But not only do scripts block uh, parallel downloads, they also block rendering. Anything that's below the script will not be rendered until the script is downloaded. So it's not always possible. You know, you might have scoping issues that require it to be higher in the page, but if not, move the scripts as low in the page as possible, or better yet, load them with an onload event handler. Um, and defer doesn't help, it only works in IE, and it's not supported by Firefox, and even in IE, it doesn't defer it to the end, it just defers it a couple uh, resources, so it'll still have this blocking behavior. We'll skip rule seven, rule eight. Uh, so far I've kind of talked a lot about scripts and style sheets being external, but should you really make them external or not? And so that really kind of depends on the uh, way users interact with the site. So if this is a site, for example, that users only come to three times a month and they only have one page view, you shouldn't make your JavaScript and CSS external, inline it. Because the advantage of making it external is it will be cached. And the next time the user comes, they'll, they won't have to download that 10K or 40K of JavaScript. But the user's only doing one page view. Their next page view might not be for eight or 10 days, and by that time, especially when we look at how many users come in with an empty cache, the, that asset might have been purged from their cache. So it might be the fastest experience for that type of site to inline everything. But then if you're a site that has multiple page views per, per session or a high revisitation rate, you might want to make those, uh, that JavaScript and CSS external components with a far future expires header, make them cacheable, and now when the user comes in, they might have to do an extra HTTP request uh, to, on their first page view, but now for the next four page views, that will be a faster experience, and there'll be less bandwidth costs. And there's a couple extra credit things you could do here. Um, post onload download is, okay, maybe like mail might be a good example. On the f first page of mail, the mail launch page, I want that to be really fast, so I'm going to put all my JavaScript and CSS in the page itself. 
Then in the onload event, I'm going to download that JavaScript and CSS again, but I'm going to download them in their external file format, and they'll get written to cache. So now when the user actually goes to the next page, uh, you can include those external assets, and they'll already be in the cache, and that page will be very fast because it'll read the JavaScript and CSS from cache rather than having to download it over the wire again. But the problem with that is that first page, that launch page, is always going to have that JavaScript and CSS in it, even if they have the external assets. So then you can do something like when you download those, those external assets, set a cookie, a pretty short-lived cookie, maybe session-based, maybe just a day or a week. And now on the back-end server, when you're serving the launch page, look for the presence of that cookie. If you see the cookie, it's a good indicator they have the external assets, so you script source. But if you don't see the cookie, inline it and do the post onload download. Uh, rule 10, uh, minify JavaScript. Uh, Google certainly does this. Uh, you'll see not uh, most of the top 10 sites don't do it. Minification, just removing white space, comments. Um, but you could also minify inline scripts too, and there's even fewer sites that do this. Uh, and I would even argue it might be easier to do that because um, you just have to hook in, hook all your JavaScript uh, script insertions into a function. And JSMin is kind of the most popular one. Uh, and it is written in almost every language, written by Doug Crockford at Yahoo. Um, and it's available in a lot of different languages, so it'd be easy to hook into your backend system. But I wanted to point out, just recently, uh, Julian LeCompte has come out with the YUI compressor that's available uh, as of about a month or two ago. And it works on JavaScript and CSS, so that's nice. Um, but it's more of an obfuscator. Uh, typically, obfuscators have, so they have greater savings. You see here, minification cut 20%. Obfuscation, where we take long function, variable names, symbol names, and make them shorter, um, has even greater savings, as you would expect. But they can also introduce bugs. I've seen that happen. Um, but the nice thing about the YUI compressor, Julian's taking a little different approach there. It's very safe. It's almost as sa safe as JSMin. Now, it's not as fast as JSMin. So if you're doing real time uh, cleanup of your JavaScript, I recommend using JSMin. But if you're doing that as part of a build process, the YUI compressor will actually have uh, greater savings. And it works on CSS as well. Uh, avoiding redirects. So I kind of call this the the worst form of blocking. I talked about how uh, scripts uh, can block downloads. But if you put a redirect in front of the HTML response, everything is delayed. So we can do things in our HTML page that I've been talking about to increase parallelization, to increase progressive rendering. But if you put a redirect in front of the HTML document, none of that hard work can be taken advantage of. So try not to put redirects uh, in front of your HTML documents. Um, the last rule I'm going to talk about is uh, making AJAX cacheable. So uh, AJAX requests are dynamic, and a lot of times we think, like our HTML documents, we almost never want to make cacheable because they're very dynamic. Okay, so AJAX responses are dynamic. Well, you know, so maybe we should make them cacheable. And a lot of times AJAX responses are personalized. They have parts of them, of them that are only appropriate for that single individual user. So you would kind of think, well, maybe I shouldn't make that cacheable. I mean, it's not a static image, for example. But the uh, scenario I always bring, bring up is something like a, a mail web app. Um, maybe uh, uh, the mail application on launch is doing an AJAX request to get your uh, addresses, right? And so those addresses, maybe you change your addresses a lot. For me, maybe I add an address once a week. So if I go to mail three times a day, seven days a week, 21 times I'm going to that page, and it's making 21 downloads of my AJAX address book. Whereas if instead we just put something in the URL that indicated the timestamp of that address book, when was the last time I edited my address book? And just on the back end server, when you're stitching together the URL for that AJAX request, make sure that you embed that in the URL. If I haven't edited my address book, the URL's the same, the AJAX request will just read from disk. But if I have changed it, the AJAX URL will change, and now I'll make another request, but I'll make it cacheable. So look at your AJAX request. You might be able to make those cacheable as well. So then really quick, I'm going to talk about the uh, second edition of the book. I'm going to give a little uh, prelude to that. I've got five new rules. One is split uh, dominant content domains. So this is uh, Google News. And you see that stair-step pattern, two, 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 right? 
And that's because uh, all of those images are using the same host name. So, and we can see that kind of 222, two, two, right? You can see that whenever you know, a dark blue one ends, the next one starts, the next one starts, the next one starts, the light blue one, so on and so on. So if we actually use two host names there instead of one, we could get four downloads in parallel. And look what it does to the overall response time of the page. Cuts about a third off the response time, right? So we've done studies and we wrote them up there about, well, how, you know, how far should I take this? Should I use three host names, four host names, five host names? We found that once you go to four and above, the benefits start degrading because of DNS lookups and I think um, thrashing on the browser side, on the CPU side. But uh, definitely splitting things across more than one domain is something to investigate. Uh, just be careful of cookie weight. The expiration model is different than HTTP. So a lot of times I think when people are creating cookies, they don't think about aggressively cleaning up that cookie weight. So try not to set your cookie expiration dates too far out or you might see those cookies lingering for a while. At Yahoo, we host our static content on a different domain that's not on yahoo.com and that is to avoid that cookie weight. Uh, for our static content, it doesn't change based on the user's cookie state. So we serve it on a different domain and those HTTP headers are much smaller. Uh, Minify CSS, now with YUI compressor, uh, I'll start doing more research on that. And we also want to do, maybe not obfuscation, but simplification, like change FFFFFF to just FFF, zero PX to just zero. Use iframes wisely, um, especially for ads. Uh, putting third-party content inside an iframe has some benefits, especially sandboxing JavaScript. Um, but just be careful about how much you do that. Don't go creating iframes willy-nilly. They're a very expensive DOM event. Just a blank iframe can add 20 to 50 milliseconds to the uh, load time of the page. Um, and so just be careful about that. I've got some more details about that that will be coming. And look at optimizing images. I haven't talked about this too much in my previous work, but we've seen sites where we could save 80% on the size of images by changing the format or just optimizing the format that we're using without any loss in uh, uh, image quality. So I'll be writing about that too. So I'm almost done. Uh, Yahoo Search is our poster child. We started working with them about a year and a half ago. We recommended these kind of front end -y performance changes. And over the year and a half, we've uh, cut the response time by 40% for broadband users. You can see, I always make the analogy, it's like um, closet space at home, right? You clean out the closet and the next week it's full again. So you can see there, like, you know, we drive things down and then the people go, oh, it's a lot faster now. Now we can add features. So you're always towing the line, right? You gotta fight, fight the battle to keep everyone focused on performance. Um, but sometimes it does allow you a little room to add, add features that users really want that improve the experience. Uh, so uh, my book is out. It's been out for about two months. Um, high performance websites. Uh, Tenny and I do a lot of talking at conferences. Uh, I mostly blog on YDN. She's on YUI blog. Um, and we've also released YSlow. How many people here have used YSlow? Very cool. How many people here use Firebug? Great. Uh, so there's the URL. You can download it. it. It's a performance lint tool. It gives you a grade against these uh, thir 13, actually the first 13 rules. It doesn't recognize Ajax right now. Working on that. It's an extension to Firebug, so it's an extension to an extension. Uh, and it's open source. So what I wanted to do now was just really quick uh, look at a couple sites. So uh, Here's www.google.com. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, do you have any sort of ongoing testing or you know, submit rules that ensure people don't make performance worse? Yeah, so the question was, do, do we at Yahoo have any kind of ongoing uh, analysis or monitoring that uh, helps us make sure that people aren't making the performance worse. Yeah, we do. We have uh, ways of running YSlow. There's this little option um, to run YSlow in auto-run mode, which means it'll kick off automatically. 
And if you, uh, I'll give you my card, if you send me an email, there's a couple open source technologies where you can actually, from like a Perl script, reach inside and touch the DOM of the browser. And so you could pull out, you could build some kind of harness that could run things in an automated fashion with a set of scripted URLs. Um, but really the, the biggest thing that we've done, and the reason why why we did why I did Y Slow and Firebug. I had I I first wrote Y Slow about two, two and a half years ago as a bookmarklet and a Grease Monkey script. And then Firebug came out and it really took off at Yahoo. Most of these rules, some of them have to do with CDNs and web server configuration, but really a lot of these rules are targeted towards front end developers. And Firebug is the tool of choice, at least at Yahoo, for front end developers. And so we wanted to try to keep this focus on performance during the product development cycle. And the way to do that that has really worked out is put it in the tool that the, you, that the developers, the front end developers are already using. So that every day as they're doing stuff, they'll just run Y slow every once in a while. And they'll know what their grade is for the thing that's out right now live. And they can see if they're getting better or worse. And it kind of keeps people on their toes, or at least it makes them aware that there's a, if they're adding a new feature, there might be a, a response time penalty for that, a trade off to consider. So we see here, uh, Google got a 99. It's not possible to get 100. So this is the highest grade you can get. Um, but I just wanted to point out, so we can see here that, that uh, it took about 170, I'm on about four megabits per second right now. It took about 170 milliseconds, and it's about 11K. So now I wanted to do this. How am I doing on time? Pretty good. All right. So very different styles to front pages, right? Yahoo uh, has a lot more content. And again, I'm not a designer. I don't want to talk about the, the uh, trade-offs there. But I just want to point out something about the way YSlow works. So we see here, this page took one second and was 153K, and yet it still got an A. How is that? YSlow, uh, <coughs> as I mentioned, I try not to um, make r recommendations about changing design. YSLO looks at the quality with which a site was built. So different sites are going to have different design requirements. Some might need more images, some might need less. Uh, some might need more JavaScript, some might need less. So uh, what YSLO does is it says, given what you've done in this page, have you done it the best way possible? So you might have a lot of JavaScript, but did you minify it? You might uh, have a lot of CSS background images, but did you do them with sprites or not? Um, so even with, so YSlow doesn't take into consideration at all the size or response time of any of the assets in the page. It's just looking at the way the page was built. Um, so I'll come back to that in a minute, but I just wanted to, uh, you know what actually is, we're running out of time a little bit, so I'm going to wrap up. And then I'll do some uh, questions. Um, so on that point, here I have the top 10 sites, their total page weight, response time, why slow grade. I did a little correlation coefficient calculation. So just a reminder, uh, correlation coefficients run from minus 1 to 1. Minus 1 means no correlation. 0 uh, means inverse correlation. 0 means no correlation. 1 means highly correlated. Anything above 0.5 is considered strong or high correlation typically. And so we're not too surprised to see that there's a very high 0.94 correlation between response time and page weight. Um, so if you have a bloated page, it's typically, typically going to be slower. But what I was very satisfied to see was this high correlation between response time and YSlow grade. Um, so YSlow was built to measure these best practices that if you follow them will make your page faster. And what we found, and we've looked at much, a lo much larger number of sites than just these, what we found is during development, where sometimes it's difficult to gather a lot of response time measurements on your page as you're building it, you can have a pretty good idea of how the page is going to respond based on your Y slow grade. If it's getting better than what's out there, you're probably going to have a faster page. If it's getting worse, your Y slow grade, you're probably going to have a slower page. So I think that's very powerful. So I wanted to wrap up the takeaways. Uh, the main thing that I emphasize is looking at performance from a different perspective. I don't want to say don't optimize back-end performance, especially for hardware cost, power consumption, but if you really want to put a dent in response times, you've got to look at this front-end part of it. Um, 
a lot of these things are not that hard to implement, and it's not that development from this point forward is going to be 10% slower because of these practices. A lot of them are get this mechanism in place, and then it's behind you. It's a gift that keeps on giving. So harvest this low-hanging fruit early on, and then you'll just reap the benefits of it on an ongoing basis. Um, so that's that one. Uh, make the investment. And uh, you should feel empowered that you control response times. So it used to be, I think, that we felt the bandwidth speed was actually the uh, most critical controller or variable for the end user response time. But we've been able to cut some response times by 50% by making these engineering changes. So there's really a lot that you do control in how fast your pages will appear to users. And finally, look out for number one. At Yahoo, users are number one. We're always focused on doing harder work, us taking on harder work to make their experience better. We kind of feel that we're the last line of defense before the pages get out to the users, and we want to do everything we can to make that experience as fast as it can be. We think that's critical at Yahoo, and I hope all of us doing front-end work uh, feel that same way, and we're all looking out for users on the Internet. And that's it. Thank you. I'll take questions. That's the Verrazano Bridge in New York City. The question was, what bridge is that? Yes. Um, well, uh, you can use. We have various ways of measuring response times. You can use services like Keynote or Gomez. Uh, you can use tools like Faster Fox. Um, the definition I have for response time uh, is the unload event to the onload event. And, excuse me, the main reason that, that I've defined it that way is because it's a measurement that we can apply across uh, all pages. And it's absolutely true that the more important thing is not to optimize this, uh, this instrumentation that's been put in place. It's to optimize the user experience. So if users engage with your page after the first, you know, uh, everything above the fold is rendered, or like in my Yahoo, the first modules across the top are rendered, then that's great. Um, and if you can, try to figure out a way to measure to that point in the page where users feel the page is engageable and they feel it's done loading. But if you're not sure, uh, we, we fall back to that definition, unload to onload. And it, also, you can play games. You can move a lot of stuff that's critical to the user experience to the onload event and make that mechanical time shorter. And so we try to emphasize, you know, whatever time you're measuring, try to understand how that instrumentation works and really understand how it reflects what the user perceives the response time to be. Yes? Uh, the question was, we observed that there's a lot more Web 2.0-ish, DHTML-ish uh, web apps that have a lot of JavaScript that runs on the client side. Um, do I see YSlow helping to measure that or uh, make performance suggestions there? Um, I'm not en envisioning that right now. We're starting to, uh, at Yahoo, especially with people like Julian and Doug there, we're starting to try to more formally gather our JavaScript performance best practices, similar to what we've done with kind of overall front-end browser web server interaction. Um, and I also feel that Firebug does a pretty good job of profiling, in fact, does an incredibly good job profiling JavaScript code on the client. And so I don't feel that there's such a lack of tools to help with that right now. Uh, uh, yes, this gentleman pointed out that um, that performance will also vary browser to browser, so you have to pay attention to that. You know, I will say that, that 
uh, the 14th rule came out from looking at more Ajaxe apps where uh, there's so much JavaScript, you know, hundreds of K of JavaScript in some cases, that all of a sudden the amount of HTTP traffic was not really the issue. It was that JavaScript code executing. Now we did kind of, we did come up with rule 14, which is, okay, well how much of that hundreds of K of JavaScript that's in, maybe in an Ajax response or JSON response, could that be cached and that will help. But there's still this whole other world where even if, even if everything was in cache, just reading that JavaScript off disk and having to uh, uh, execute it could take seconds. And there's some exciting things um, coming up in uh, JavaScript performance uh, out of Microsoft and um, I forget who the other folks are. Uh, so stay tuned to that, though, you know, some ways of improving JavaScript uh, performance by an order of magnitude or more. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. What's the intuition behind the browser stalling fetches when it's downloading some scripts? It's done the question was, why do the browser developers stall things when they download scripts? Um, so the idea is that uh, suppose you downloaded scripts in, so I want to preface this by saying um, I've talked with uh, the IE team and I'm uh, hoping to, I've passed on the suggestion to the Mozilla team. Uh, there's no reason you couldn't download scripts in parallel uh, and get everything to work correctly, but it, it would be a fair amount of work. And here's the reason they don't do it now. They didn't do it initially. Suppose you have two scripts, A and B. A is 100K, B is 1K, but B requires A, and you have them in that order, and you decide to download them in parallel. Well, guess what? B is going to come back first, it's going to be executed, and it's going to generate errors because the code it relies on has not been downloaded yet. So that's one reason. There's also the document write reason. So uh, that's one reason why they only download one thing uh, at a time uh, to make sure that scripts will be downloaded and executed in order. But clearly we can all think of ways that you could achieve that without having to have this blocking behavior. I will say that Opera 6 uh, does do download of images in parallel with scripts. And that's kind of nice, but still it will not download more than one script at a time. Okay, two more questions. Uh, okay, three more questions. How much of performance boost you can get by turning on pipelining? Yeah, the question was, have we looked at how much pipelining uh, helps with performance? It helps a lot. I don't have numbers that are firmer than that because we feel it's moot. Um, uh, I forget what it is. Like Firefox has pipelining support, but it's turned off by default. And IE, even IE7, doesn't support pipelining. So it's going to be so long before we could really take advantage of that. We We've looked at it a little bit, but we haven't spent too much time quantifying it. Have you looked at uh, JavaScript parse times at all? Are there certain constructs more expensive to parse? Uh, do you mean parse time just, uh, separated from execution time? No, I don't have any uh, best practice. The question was, have we looked at best practices for making JavaScript parse time faster? Nothing comes to mind. Um, well, the grades we measure with Y slow, do you mean the response times? Right, right. Like, if you have some specific tune that you measure, how do you measure as you go? Oh, well, a lot of times, so you don't mean mechanically how do we measure the time, just what's our process for, yeah. yeah. So, you know, sometimes there's nothing you can do. You make a change and it just goes out and you just have to measure the site that's out there. And there's lots of variables that could make that a, uh, that comparison invalid. Um, so what we try to do is we try to run things in parallel. So we'll have uh, a subset of users, some that are exposed to the benefit and some that are the control. And then among those users, we can see uh, how fast or slow the page is. Um, so that's the best way to do side-by-side -side comparisons. Yeah, or we can use scripted means as well, Kino Gomez things. And maybe last question and then I'll wrap up. Was there one more? Yes. 
Have you received contributions to YSLOW from outside of Yahoo? And if so, what kind? The question was, um, have I received contributions to YSLOW from outside? And if so, what kind? No, the, it's an open source license, but the, uh, it's not open code. We don't have the code published. Uh, we get, um, I won't say lots, maybe one or two emails a day of bugs or suggestions. Um, and we're, uh, you know, working on a new release. We try to do monthly releases. Um, but certainly, um, uh, going to an open code uh, like Firebug has is something that we've talked about, and I imagine will come uh, in some time, but it's not on the roadmap right now. Okay, so I wanted to wrap up and let everyone get back to work. Thank you for having me.